You sure did. We're glad to see you here tonight. And yes, we got one more night. We're not done yet. And so uh, till they blow the horn, we just go keep on. Amen. So at uh, this time to begin our service here, if we have anybody that wants to come to the altar and pray, uh, y'all come on. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father God, we we come before you, Lord. Some of us in a hurry, Lord. Some of us, God, in trouble. Some of us, oh Lord, that need a touch from your hand. God, we pray that you pour down your spirit like rain on this altar. Lord, that the people, whether they be few or many, God, when they come, that they would be uh, refreshed and blessed. Almighty God, and reassured, Lord, that you are still the God of gods, the Lord of lords, and the King of kings. Father God, reassure your word in our hearts today. And God, we just ask you, Lord, to bless this service in a special way. Lord, it's blessed my heart this week, and I'm sure it's blessed others. And so, Lord, we just turn this thing over to you right now. In the name of Jesus and by his blood and all God's children say it. Amen. Amen. I guess we'll start with a hymn. Amen. Good evening. Good evening. Oh, we got to fill in some pews. We got a lot of empty pews. So maybe while we're fellowshipping and singing, we'll fill them up like we did last night. So let's all stand to our feet. And as we get ready to do our opening hymn, let's take just a minute and greet those that are around you. Let them know you're glad to see them. Tis so sweet.
opening hymns. He is so sweet to trust in Jesus. Y'all stand and sing this out tonight now. Good evening. Yeah. How are y'all? I'm doing well. Well, tonight, one of my dear friends, Miss Hope Tyson, is going to come and worship with us through a message in song. So let's make Hope welcome. <laughs>
one is called Thank You. Um, this is a song that my dad used to do. streets of gold beside the crystal sea we heard the angels singing and someone called your name you turned and saw this young man and he was smiling as he came and he said friend you may not know me now and then he said but wait to teach my Sunday school when I was only eight. And every week you would say a prayer before the class would start. And one day when you said that prayer, I asked Jesus, Thank you for giving 
Thank the Lord. Thank you, Coach. Well, are y'all glad to be here tonight? Amen? Amen. Well, I'll tell you, I, I, I was about half asleep this afternoon, and the, and the Lord passed by and gave me a word. Amen? So you must have been the crowd that was supposed to hear it. And so I'm going to do everything I can to make sure you hear it. Amen? Uh, so that when we get out of here, my hands will be clean and yours will be clean. Amen? And we can move on. We got four... Uh, scriptures tonight we want to talk to you about. We've had a wonderful, wonderful week. I hate Brother Randy Perry couldn't come, uh, and the reason he couldn't come, but uh, we're grateful that we had some men that picked up the slack, uh, and Jackie and Tony have done some tremendous preaching and, and filling in, and I'm just very thankful uh, for all they've done, and you have too. I'm thankful for y'all and all those who have come. Uh, we just are so excited about what God has in store and he hasn't, he's not finished yet. Uh, when he gets finished, I think we'll hear uh, some loud noises, and we'll talk about one of them tonight. But our first scripture tonight, if you have your Bible, is going to come in Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32. And if you have your Bible, read with us. If you don't, look up here on the screen. it will be up there. Uh, and and this will be a very familiar portion of scripture to you uh, when you see it. Uh, but uh, that's all right. God got a plan. Amen. And his plan is better than my plan. And in verse beginning in verse 16, and it says, And the tablets uh, were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God, graven upon the tablets. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, and he said unto Moses, There is a noise of war in the camp. And he said, it is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. And it came to pass as soon as he came nigh unto the camp that he saw 
the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tables out of his hands and brake them beneath the mount. And he took the calf which they had made and burned it into fire and ground it to powder and strewed it upon the water and made the children of Israel drink of it. And, you know, I'm not going to preach on this, but while I'm passing by, I'll just put a little footnote there for you so you'll remember it. Uh, you know, the, the Bible talks often about the disciples of Jesus, and it says that when Jesus had died, they remembered the words that he said. They remembered the day that he sat down and taught them uh, about the subject that they were having to go through. But this little nugget right here I just want to uh, put in there. One day you're going to drink of your sin. As, as these people here, he ground up the, uh, the false calf that they had been worshiping and put it in the water and made them drink it. That's exactly what's going to happen uh, with people in sin. God's going to make you drink your sin that's not covered in the blood of Christ. Amen. And Moses said unto Aaron, What did this people unto thee that thou hast brought so great a sin upon them? And Aaron said, Let not the anger of the, my Lord wax hot, and so on and so forth. I don't, we don't need to go any further. The thing I want to get out of there is, is, number one, I want us to talk about the tablets. I want us to talk about the proximity to, that sin has to worship uh, because Moses is up there with the Lord He's getting a word from the Lord, and the people of God are over there in the world uh, sinning against the very God that Moses went up there uh, to have a conversation with. And I thought to myself, you know, that's exactly where we are today. That's exactly what's going on. Half the church is, is listening, up there getting a the word, and the other half is sinning. The other half is, is having a worldly party somewhere. It doesn't matter uh, what you're doing in the world. If you're not with God, you're against him. That's what Jesus said. If you're for me, you're for me. If you're not, you're against me. And so the thing is we don't need to get down to the nitty-gritty and itemize and try to defend every little thing that we said, done, or are thinking or planning to do. Uh, but what we need to do is just realize we're either with him or we're against him. And Jesus said that very clearly. You're for me or you're against me. That's the problem a church has today as we live in this world. Uh, they, uh, I want you to notice what was in the, in the word that they brought down. And uh, we're going to move right along here, and I'm, I'm going to get you to where we need to go. The work, of, it says in the tablets, and these tables were the work of God. Now, the tables that he carried down, there's a replica of those tables. Uh, and you go to Exodus 20, and, and I'm sure you've seen many other replicas of the commandments of the Lord. That's what was on the tablets. I was reading just the other day about, about those tablets and the, the ones that uh, God ultimately wrote again with his fingers. And, and they're in the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant is going to be in heaven. And, and it's going to be there that the law of God is going gonna, gonna to rule there as well as it rules here. Uh, God, is, uh, the, God, everything he says is, is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. It will never change. Uh, we can write different versions of it. We can we'll try to deny it all we want to. But the truth of it is, uh, I was talking to a fellow today, and he says, well, some people uh, are liberal and some are conservative. I said, well, brother, uh, let me tell you one thing. The Bible is the Bible, and the Bible is the Word of God. And, and, and this, this is nonsensical for us to even think about or talk about uh, this kind of stuff. But anyhow, it had the work, work of God there. Jesus one time said that the things I do, if you don't believe me, if you're having trouble believing me, then believe the, the works that I do because the works that I do, uh, God has given them to me. They are the work of God. Moses had the work of God under his arm, and he was bringing it down to the people of God so that they would know how to live, that they wouldn't be destroyed, and, but yet they were destroyed even before he got back with the tablet. And with the word. And, and then it says, and the writing was the writing of God. God, it's, it's a personal letter to all of us, to, to the whole world, to that group then, and to us tonight. It's the personal letter from God to us. Don't have other gods before me. Don't hey, honor the, the name of the Lord. Don't take my name in vain. And though, hey, let me tell you, it's a personal letter to keep us from being destroyed. From God to us. It was so great when Moses received it and he was in the presence of God. They had to cover his face so the people could look on him. And that's exactly what happens. When we get in the presence of God, it causes our face to shine as if we'd been with the Lord. I remember they, they said of, of the disciples of Jesus and when they were or the apostles, you could tell that they had been with the Lord. 
And, and that's the day where you could tell that they had been with the Lord uh, when they came down. But uh, here's where we really want to get. This is, there's a lot of noise going on there. Uh, you know, oftentimes in the church today, people want a lot of noise going on. Uh, a lot of programs, a lot of things going on, these additive things that we're bringing into the church uh, that have never been heard of until this contemporary society in which we're living. These additive things that, that men want to hear and prefer over God and, and the black lights and, and all the stuff that we have brought into the church that, that doesn't glorify God. There was a noise going on down there and the noise I caught the attention of God and those, those that were in the cloud up there and the noise caught the attention and when Moses came down he saw why there was such a noise the singing and the dancing and, and all the other stuff that was going on there uh, right in close proximity at the base of the very mountain in which God had put himself in to commune with Moses folks can y'all believe that can y'all believe that now let me tell you something these people uh, they this trip that they were on was not a very pleasant trip uh, they were coming out of bondage. You'd have thought that they would have been a little more careful not to get back in bondage. You would have thought they'd have paid a little bit more attention uh, not to go back where they'd come from. Egypt is just a place. Uh, the bondage is everywhere. Uh, bondage was in Egypt. They came right over out of Egypt into the wilderness and placed themselves right back under the bondage. And and. Their deliverance was death. God killed them, slew them in the wilderness because they couldn't get through there because they couldn't get over not being uh, my friend in Egypt. They wanted to go back and eat their meat. They wanted to go back and, and do all that was over there, but yet while they were over there doing it, they whined the whole time they were there, cried out to God and everything else. They just weren't satisfied anywhere. So people that aren't satisfied anywhere need to die. That's what God said. Need to die, put them out of their misery, and they won't make nobody else miserable, and they can go on to whatever home they have coming. Amen? Uh, uh, is any of y'all here tonight miserable? I mean, if you are, wouldn't it be better for you to just go ahead and take leave of your life here in this world? If it's so bad that you can't uh, live in it, uh, wh what about that great God that we got to hold? We got a hold of his hand. Hold to God's unchanging hand. What about him? Can he help us get out of where we are? Can he lead us away instead of us playing around with them false gods? And I'm going to tell you, you know who was down there leading the show? The associate pastor. He was down there leading the program while, while the leadership was up there getting the word from God. And I'm going to tell you, that's exactly the way it is today. That's exactly the way it is today. And, and the, it, we, the leadership is, is split. I mean, so there are people in our churches that know what's going on is wrong, but they ain't got the gall to stand up and say, that's wrong. Don't have the gall to stand up and take a stand because we're worried more about uh, people's feelings being hurt and being offended than we're worried about their soul that's going to burn in hell. And so that's where we are. Are you in any of that number? Are you in that group? Uh, had you rather be down there with the party crowd well, I could have read on there. We know that several thousand died around that fire down there that night. We know that they had to take a stand there. He said, who's on the Lord's side? Let them stand with me. And thousands died around that campfire. Don't y'all understand that? Don't y'all understand? And don't you know enough to tell your children? You know, I found out something the other day, and I believed it all my life. It's just like when I was growing up, I was told that, the, that money is the root of all evil. That's not a true statement. The love of money. But I, I found out something else about our children. And look here, our sins that we commit, they will pass from generation to generation. But the, the, the consequence of it, won't, our children won't have to bear the burden of our sin, uh, the consequence of it, because we are the one that committed sin. They, they might live in that sin, but it, they won't bear our guilt. It's just coming down to those generations. How, how they live out there at your house is how they're going to live when they grow up and you gone ain't around no more. Amen. Do y'all see this? The church is, and, and I think Jackie said this the other night, there, or somebody said, there's too much. The church has become too world, and the world's become too church, has become more churchy. And, and I thought about that a long time, and I still think about it, and I don't know quite all that that carries, uh, but maybe we can take that and develop it. Uh, this didn't end very well. This isn't end very well for all that's going on here, and it's not going to end very well for those that are doing it today. 
I'm telling you, grace is at work today. Did y'all know that? One of the fruit of the Spirit is long-suffering. If you go there and read, long-suffering, God is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. So God is long-suffering to usward, as the Bible says. He, he's waiting for us to come to our senses like the prodigal boy and, and get up to the pig trough and come out of the party environment and come back where you know you belong in the first place. He's waiting for that. Amen. And is he waiting for you? Are you, are you in the party spirit? Had you rather party than switch? I used to when I was growing up, there was a, they used to have Tarleton cigarettes. And, and the old boy that was the Tarleton model, uh, he had a black eye on, the, on them signs like it's out there. And he had a black eye and the, and the note was on there, I'd rather fight than switch. Huh? Y'all, some of you young people don't remember all that stuff, but uh, Lord, that was way back before the war. It's a long time ago. Uh, but the, of course, you know what the thing was there. Uh, you know, I'd rather have a black eye than do away with my Tarletons. But I, I don't know what it's going to I don't know. I don't understand it. And, and a long time ago, I quit trying to think about anything that I might know other than what I've read today and yesterday that's in God's Word. And I know that that'll be hanging around forever, and I know that it's all truth. And I know that if God said it, there's no way it can be wrong. Anything can be wrong with it. And so that means that we can grab a hold of it. What was going on here was wrong. And the Lord heard it from, from the mountain. And he told Moses, get down there. Get down there and see. See, that's the way God talks to us that he, he puts in leadership. Get down there and see what's going on in their life. If you don't get down there, preacher, they're going to ruin yourself. Get down there and, and tell them what they're doing is wrong. Get down there with a, with a word from me. I mean, Moses came down with the word under his arm, but he had a flesh problem. He got mad and threw that down. He, I guess he forgot what he had to. But, I mean, after all, if your brother that you had left, your brother, the, the priest, it, it, you had left him kind of down there to kind of help the people. I mean, the man hadn't been down there gone six months. He'd just gone up there to talk with the Lord on the rest of their destination, their journey there. And, and here they are. They can't wait a day or two. They can't wait. They got to have another God to serve, and they got to have a party environment. It was just all kind of stuff going on there. I want to tell you, you won't have to drive far in Columbus County to get to, get to a party environment. You won't, have to, you won't have to look for many people before you find a bunch of people that are on go when it comes to party. They, they will gladly go with you and gladly participate. And then, uh, like the devil, they will laugh at you when you're out of fellowship with the church and out of, out of fellowship with the Lord. Uh, but these people, they paid a great price. This was a noise that we don't want to hear. A great noise being made, but it was a noise Moses did not want to hear. Joshua did not want to hear it. And I'm telling you, the church, you ought not to want to hear it in your fellowship. Uh, Tony, right now, at, over at the church he pastors, uh, they're bringing discipline back to the church. We've got to, we've got to bring discipline back in the church. Discipline has gone. And it doesn't matter whose family is failing, we have to bring a loving discipline back to the house of God. We have to bring it because God demands it of us and requires it of us that, that we take under our arm the word and the work of God and take it to the people. And, and when, even at the campfire of sin, we have to go and we have to tell, and, and there needs to be a discipline. Who's on the Lord's side? Get on over here. If not, as you continue on, you're at your own peril. And that's what he says. Amen? There's another scripture I want us to read. Go to Nehemiah, if you will, chapter 8. And Nehemiah, I, I'm in Nehemiah right now. My every what trip through the Bible, I love Nehemiah. I could go over there and I love to preach out the book of Nehemiah. I'm telling you, it's just awesome. But in Nehemiah, he had gone over there. The gates had been torn down and burned. The, uh, the walls had been torn down. The city was in disarray. The people were scattered. It was a pitiful state in that particular uh, nation uh, that had been overrun and left uh, desolate, so to speak. Uh, but uh, they went ahead and done the work. Uh, they done the work in the midst of all kind of criticism. Uh, Sambalat and Tobiah and, and that crowd, the like that followed them. Uh, there's always somebody pulling and tugging against the work 
uh, that the church is trying to do or you as a Christian are trying to do. There's always a force trying to tug against you and, and work against you. So they had gone through all that. They had even taken up weapons and, and stayed awake at night because they, Sambalat had told them, we're going to come in while you're sleeping and, and destroy it all again. And so, but they were ready. They had a determination and they were ready. So they, they built and completed the walls. And, and in chapter 8, uh, we have a scripture there I want to read. And this is another noise. I want you to hear about another noise. Uh, and I think you'll like this noise. Uh, when they had finished, uh, Nehemiah gives us a list of the, of the families and, and some of the people that are there and, and what's going on in them. And then he tells us about the first worship service. You see, Ezra uh, was there with them, and Ezra was a scribe, and that's the keeper of the book, the keeper of the word. And so he was there with them, and when they got through, he did something. They found this book, and I can see it. And you know, I've been in barns and places where people moved out of houses, and they left their Bibles. They left their dusty Bibles, and you, you could take, you'd take a dust rag, and you'd clean it off, and it was as good as new. But isn't that something? I know at our, when my mama died and, and we were down there and, and, and they had well, whatever stuff she had, it weren't a whole lot, but whatever stuff she had, everything had been given away, guess what was left? Mama's old Bible. And somebody looked at me and said, buddy, you want this? I says, is the Pope Catholic? Has the catfish got scales or don't have scales? You know I want my mama's Bible. Chassie used it in her wedding uh, here at the church. Mama's old Bible. Most people will leave them old dusty Bibles. Because you ain't going to read it. If you were reading it, you'd see a change in your life. It's like an old dirty car. If you polish it, you'll see the shine. And if you read the Word of God, the Bible says it's powerful and quicker than in any two-edged, sharper than any two-edged sword. And it's good for all these things. And it would change you immediately if you get in the Word of God. And you'll, every once in a while, you'll cry out to the Lord because it cuts you so deep and cuts you so long. Every once in a while, you'll scream, Lord, help me. I didn't realize how wretched and wicked I am. But here, here they are. And, and they haven't worshipped in so long. They've been captive and been scattered and uh, didn't have a house of worship to go to. Isn't that a shame tonight? I, listen, I, I thought about this today, and the Lord gave me this. Uh, you know, I can remember used to, people used to visit other churches in revival. I mean, when you go to another church for a revival, you wouldn't know half the people there because they come from other churches. They travel. People travel to come to revival. I can, I, God, I, I don't know what spirit got in New Horizon. Our people won't even travel from home to come to revival. Hey, amen? I love y'all to death. Amen? I really do, but I'm just going to tell you, uh, you, you got couch problems. Amen? And, uh, and we, we'd rather sit at home on the couch because, you see, uh, we blame our day, how, how tired it, our day made us. Well, would you like to give up your job and shut up grumbling and complaining? See, that's the whole deal. You got to have a job because the Lord said, if you don't work, you, ain't, you shouldn't be eating. That's what the Lord said. And so I, I think it's safe to repeat that. So you need a job. So quit complaining about the job you had. Just hush up. And if you're tired, tell the Lord, Lord, I'm weary in my bones. But if, you, if you'll give me a little spark, I think I can make it. Amen. Now, people were telling me today, look here, when, that, when this thing gets so fast, you're going to get tired and it's going to rise fast. You're going to get weary, but you can make it. Spiritual singers wrote, climbing up the rough side of the mountain. Yeah, doing my best to make it in. These folks here had worked, and when they weren't working during the day, they were guarding during the night for self-preservation. They were guarding themselves because the threat was that they were going to destroy it again. But when the day came and Ezra stood up and took the dust off the old Bible, it really it was just a manuscript that he stood up and cleaned it up and he opened up that thing and he began to ring and the people began to shout praises unto the Lord. They began to shout and they began to glorify God. That was a noise that hadn't been heard in that city for a long time. I'm telling you, the church needs to hear the shout come back to it. The church needs to, when we hear the word of God, it says, he didn't say, well, all rise, please don't honor God. The Bible said when he, when he picked up the word in his hand, everybody stood up and everybody raised their hands and heart and began to praise the Lord. I'm telling you right now, uh, uh, folks, things are different, aren't they? Things are different now than they used to be. 
I don't know what happened. I know it's the easy outs to say the devil's done all this. I think we helped him. We did, if we hadn't went along, he couldn't have done it. The Bible says resist him and he'll flee from you. I think we helped him. I really do. Ain't it a shame that we helped him along? But you know what? If we'll just talk to God about it, he'll forgive us. If we'll get over there at the call of God tonight, who's on the Lord's side, just get over there on his side and you won't die around the fire of sin. Get over there on the Lord's side and stand with him. But these people, they were so excited and they were so glad. It wasn't a problem for the next couple of days to get them repented because they spent a quarter of a day repenting of their sin. They, they, they spent their time. Once their work was, they had their hand in the work and that was done, man, they went to act. They worshiped. They worshiped God. They made noise unto the Lord. This is a good noise. This is not a worldly noise. Them people out there, Sam Balatin didn't like it. I'm going to tell you right now, those people that were with, uh, with Moses back there in Exodus, they didn't, like, they didn't like him coming down there and acting like he acted. Look here. They asked him, didn't you get the memo? We're contemporary. <laughs> we all know how that worked out, right? Huh? It amazes me. We got contemporary services now to, to soothe and satisfy. Uh, it's like the Democratic Party. They got that far left wing. We got a far left wing in our churches. We got the contemporary uh, to satisfy the far left. Amen. Hey, where does that stuff come from? But that's what we got. Now, and that's where we're headed. We're going deeper, deeper, deeper into that swamp, not realizing how many alligators are in it. Not realizing how dangerous it is, but I tell you right now, if you hadn't heard, heard the word in a while, it'll help you. But I'm telling you right now, if, if you'll just get a hold of this word and hide it in your heart, what did David say? I, I hide it in my heart that I don't sin against you. See, the, the, the whole idea of God's word, uh, not to put it on a bracelet around our arm or on a, a little thing on our forehead, but to hide it in our heart. We won't no longer have to teach every man his neighbor, but God said, I'll write it upon their heart. He, he talks about a stone in our heart upon which God wrote. Remember that, that stone that Moses was carrying? What did it have on it? The writing of the Lord. The writing of the Lord. And in our hearts, God writes his law in our hearts. That's why when we're sinning, we're out of character with God. Amen? That's exactly what happens. But there was a revival broke out there in Nehemiah. These people done stuff. They, they, they corrected what they could of the sins which they had committed, whether in ignorance or not. It was all because they did not obey God. Now, I want y'all to just back up a minute with me and just let's just pause, let our blood calm down a little bit. And I want you to just think a minute what God told the children of Israel about kings. If you'll go back over there, and, and it says between judges and the kings, it says and everybody did what was right in his eyes or her eyes uh, because they, they had no judges in that time. And then these people began to cry out to God, we need a king. And God said, folks, listen to me. Uh, you don't need a king. I know what's better for you. If you get a king, here's what's going to happen. He's going to take your land. He's going to take everything. He's just going. It's going to be him, not you. It, it's, it's not going to be good. He, he said, well, we want to be like our neighbors. They have kings, and, and we want to show off our king. Didn't they say it? Maybe not in that paraphrased word, but they said it. And they went over there, and said, God said, okay. Here he comes. The very first one, you know what happened to him. God took the spirit away from him. He fell on his own sword. He was a crazy man after that. You know why he was a crazy man? He didn't do what God told him. He jumped ahead of the prophet. He went ahead of, of what God said do instead of what kings do. You see, David would have never gotten in trouble if he'd have done what kings were supposed to do. For in the day when they were at war, kings were supposed to be at war. But he stayed home. Y'all remember that? But anyhow, that's what we got. So God told him. So these kings come. Now look here. Here's what you get when you read the Chronicles and you read the Kings and, and you read anything. It, it tells you that this king reigned for 48 years and he did that that was right in the sight of the Lord. 
And his son, he died and was buried in the tomb with his fathers. And his son began to reign. And he lived and did reign opposite of what his father did. And so during that time, it was the same thing over there in the judges. Uh, they would get, bring in a judge, and the judge would go and blow back the enemies that were causing suffering among the people of God, and then he would reign for 20 years or however how long, a generation, and the kings did the same thing. A, a father would rule and rule according to the ordinance of God. A son would come along and rule according to the ordinance of the heathen, and so you just had chaos all the time. And, and the reason Jerusalem is burned, the reason the people are captive is because their fathers, Nehemiah said it, me and my fathers, we're the ones that brought this mess upon us that we now suffer. But the shout came when they realized that they had been restored. The word of God had been lifted up again. Now, I'm going to tell you, church, if, if, if I'm dead and gone, or, or somebody you love and trust a lot's dead and gone, and if you ever let somebody come in this church, or the church that you go to with a false word, you're as guilty as the false teacher. You're as guilty as the false teacher for not doing something about it. You say, I didn't know I had the right. Yes, you do. Yes, you do have the right. In fact, it's a responsibility of yours to ensure that you don't heap to yourself false teachers. It, they're going to be so smart, they're going to get through the, the screen anyway, so to speak. Because when, when people that don't read the Bible are listening to a sermon, they don't know if it's right or wrong. They remember excerpts of it because they heard a little bit of it when they were going to church. But they don't, if they don't read the Bible, they don't know what the Bible says. So they don't know how to tell somebody, hey, you're on the wrong page. And that's exactly what's happening. I was thinking today about Esther. Y'all know what happened in the book of Esther, don't you? God raises up somebody to, to deliver his people. But an old boy named Haman, uh, he set out to destroy the one that God's raising up, Mordecai. He set out to destroy him, and of course, Esther was related to Mordecai. And so Mordecai worked and got Esther in there before the king because Esther was a knockout. She was a dream gal, and he wanted her to become the queen who would stand before the king and influence the king as it relates to the people of God. And it all worked out. And, of course, you know that, that Haman, he thought that he was going to get to kill Mordecai. He thought the king was talking about him, and all the time he was talking about Mordecai. Mordecai was the one that's going to wear the, ki the kingly garments and going to wear uh, the stuff on him. That's what the king said, do to whoever it is. That, that, and so they hanged old Haman on the gallows he built for Mordecai. I want to tell you all something. What we're seeing right now in Washington, D.C., that's exactly what's happening. Everything that that Democratic Party is doing to try to get Donald Trump is coming back on them in every arena that they have tried to destroy him. They're just absolutely making a fool out of leadership. We won't never heal from it in my lifetime. And your children probably won't heal from it. The idiocy of what we call Democrats and Republicans. We won't never get over it. We are a godless nation with godless leaders who are nothing but bald-faced liars who stand and lie every day and they're not ashamed to lie and will back it up with a lie and with the law. And I'm telling you, it's got to end. Look for them to fall on their face or be hanged from that gallows that they've intended for somebody else. Amen. I am not come here to preach politics, but I'm telling you, that's exactly what's going to happen. You're going to die on the rack that you built to hang people. It may take a while. It may take a while, but it's going to happen. Amen. Nehemiah. And so they worship there. Folks, I'll tell you, I just get so excited that Ezra described stood upon a pulpit of wood which they had made for the purpose and beside him stood Mattathiah and Shema and Ananiah and Yerja and Hilkiah and I'll tell you right now I need to tell you Hebrew Messiah in his right hand 
And on his left, Padiah and Mishael and Malachi and all the Amalekites and Handanas and Meshulams. And, and Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. There you go. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen. I get about three every night. Uh, with lifting up their hands, and they bowed their head and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And Joshua and Bani and Sherebiah and Jamin and Nakablub and all them that caused the people to understand the law. And the people stood in their place, so they read in the book in the law of God distinctly and gave them sense and caused them to understand the reading. There has to be an understanding of the God, word of God, the writing of God, and these Levites are helping that cause. Nehemiah, which is Tershatha and Ezra the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people, said unto all the people, This day is a holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not nor weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. You preach on church attendance today, and everybody argue with you. I don't think you have to be there every time the door's open. Where do you read that at? You read the Bible, and I think you'll get a different understanding. <clears throat> I don't think it's a <clears throat> beer here, to be, a beer there, a glass of wine's going to hurt you. You can read the Bible, and you have a different understanding. Amen? Amen? You, just got, uh, you just got to remember. You just got to remember. And, and it may seem very harmless. In fact, Johnny Hunter, tell you, somebody told me they heard Dr. Johnny say, uh, he didn't think it harmed him and his wife a bit if they had a bottle of wine sat down with their lunch. Well, follow Johnny Hunt. That ain't what God said. I mean, he's well known, nationally known fella. And if he said that, he's a liar. Amen? A little short Indian liar that was born again up there in Wilmington. That's all he is. Read the Bible. And, and we, we've just gone so far. I mean, if you pay a man $6,000 for two hours of preaching, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd probably say what they need, you know, or if somebody weren't really cared about it, they, they'd have, they would. Y'all believe that, $6,000 for two hours of preaching? But that's what's happening. And when you think about all that stuff, and you think about it, that's what's going on in our world. Uh, it's the same verbiage, word, uh, one word at a time. You take a 2,500-word message and keep changing two or three words at a time, after a while you won't have no message. After a while you won't, you won't have anything left, and that's exactly the old man complained all the time, uh, and he didn't go to church, preacher would visit him and, and talk to him, and he'd say, well, I don't believe that page. Where are you at in the Bible? He, and the preacher would read He said, I don't believe it, and he tore it out and threw it down. Tore it out of his Bible there by the bedside. And you, time went on, days went on, months and years went on, and the fellow was dying. And, and he called for the preacher and said, uh, get the preacher over here. I'm dying. I'm not ready to die. And so uh, he got over there, and he, he began to talk to the preacher and said, Preacher, I need you to help me. I, I'm dying, and I need help. He said, How am I going to help you? You tore out all the pages of God's Word that you didn't believe. You see, every day you live in sin, you're tearing out a page from God's Word that you don't believe every day when you support somebody in sin you're tearing out a page from god's word the bible says it in another way it says uh, not only do we find favor with these people we become partakers with them when we agree amen i think it's time to change don't y'all all right let's go to acts chapter three I, i'll tell you it seems like it ain't moving as fast as i thought it would but uh, that's all right uh, Y'all don't have anything to do tonight, do you? Everybody that stays, I'll, I'll take you back there and make you a cup of coffee. Amen. Acts chapter 3. That, no, I don't want to bribe you to stay. If I, if I got to pay you, you'd fare better off going home, wouldn't you? Acts chapter 3. Something great's happening there in Acts. You know that the boys have been up in the upper room, the ladies and gentlemen and, and little boys and girls. Uh, you know, I, I, some of you little boys and girls that are here tonight, uh, you know, the Bible said that they were boys and girls, 120. Uh, and I, I just want to see, I want to see a 12-year-old girl full of the Holy Ghost and in boldness. I want to see a 17-year-old girl 
14 years old. I want to see 12 year old, and I want to see children, that little seven year old laying there. I want to see you full of the Holy Ghost because they went up in that room and they came down full of the Holy Ghost. If they didn't, my Bible's a lie. Uh, the Bible said they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and the fire set on them, the tongues of fire set on them, and they all came down with a new language. I just want to tell y'all something. If we ever needed something new to happen in our churches, it needs it now. We need, we need to clean up. We, the old preacher said that he had 12 members going to his church. The church had just about uh, burned out, and they called him down there to help them. He said that they had 12 members, and he said he, prayed, he preached on sweeping out the church. And he said when he got through, 12 of them got up and walked out and swore they weren't never coming back. He said me and my wife visited them. I got down on my knees, and he said I told them I won't never. If you'll come back, I won't never preach on sweeping out the church. He said they never got them back again. He didn't have a 12. I'm beginning to feel. Hewitt Goblin told me just before he died. I'm beginning to feel what he was feeling. Tom, they about all left, son. They don't want to hear this, this word that comes straight. They about all left. Tears running down his eyes. He said, I've driven them all away. No, I said, Brother Hewitt, it ain't you. It's that word of God and that stinking life they live in. That's what's driving them away. Who in the world wants to sit there and be cut going and coming, going and coming, because they're not willing yet to repent. And if they won't turn, it's going to hurt every time they hear you preach. And that's exactly, I think I'm getting a little wind and that's what's happening here. Amen. Uh, you know, I believe that's happening after all these years. I, I tell you. They, it was hip, hip, hoorah when Tony and Jackie were preaching. You hear it tonight, don't you? Y'all, in fact, I see some of you nodding. That's what happens. You get used to it. That's what happens. Don't y'all fall over that balcony now when you go to sleep over there. But you, you see what we're talking about? You understand where we're going with that? That's exactly uh, what, what's happening. That's exactly uh, what goes on. But anyway, uh, they, they come down there, and it, what did I do with my glasses? Does anybody see him? Oh, okay. I said, thank you all very much. Uh, Tony didn't have his last night, and I can't find mine. When I find them, uh, they have to reflect back. I can't see out of them no more. My eyesight's are good since I have my cataracts out. I can see too good, but I need something to read with. And these things here is like a Coca-Cola bottom or something. I don't know. I, I think I'd get more service. Out. Verse 3 of Acts chapter 3, if you want to read with me, read with me. And it says, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, ask an alms. And Peter fastened his eyes upon him with John and look, look on, said, look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, silver and gold, have I none but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up uh, immediately. His feet and his ankle bones received strength. That's amazing. And he leaping up, stood and walked and entered with him into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. Do y'all think he was saying, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord? Y'all think that's the way he went in there? The Bible said he, he, when that strength went in there, he leaping. And jumping and praise God all the way into the temple. I'll tell you, them Pharisees had a bad day that day. Can I tell y'all? The Pharisees said, what in God's name is wrong with him? I don't know what it is. He sure didn't get that here. There ain't nobody here been that happy since I've been coming here. I tell you right now, when God gets a hold of somebody, all of you will be happy. What we need to see is a church full of happy people one time. We need to see one shout and then another join in. We need to see the Holy Ghost come and look like a smoke on the altar in our churches. Woo! So that old men and old women, they will quit complaining about arthritis and get up out of the pew and shout and bring the young people with them. Bring them full of the power of God and the Holy Ghost. We can have revival. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm going to tell you. Can you imagine how that man must have felt? I just want you to know it was absolutely awesome what happened to him. The response was not written down and pre-planned. Boy, when that, when that thing hit him, when he realized it says, 
and he took him by the right hand. I, Tony, I'm going to study that. There's a lesson right there. Why didn't he take him by the left? But he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Have y'all ever seen anybody with, with bad, and seen that the little old legs weren't big as a baby's arm? You could reach around them. And, and, and their fingers were all grown, and, and their hands turned, and he sat in there uh, skinny from not eating too. Can y'all imagine that man being drugged there every day and that bunch of hypocrite Christians going in and out of that church They paid no attention to him? The only thing he, they paid attention to, they tried to get on the other side of the street to keep him trying to help him get a bite to eat for that day. But there he was, all drawn up. Them bones had turned the way that they shouldn't have turned. But I'm going to tell you, Peter said, I don't have no gold to give you. I, hey, I don't even have the money to buy you lunch. But let me tell you what I do have. I just come down from the upper room. Hey, I just met with the Savior. I got that glow of Moses on me. I got something to give you. Such as I have, I'll give it to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, get up from there. And uh, he said he took him by the right hand and leaping up from there. He be, can y'all just see that for a minute? How them twisted bones and all that mess all of a sudden aligned. And that man had strength. And he went leaping up and down. I can imagine quite a scene was, was had there. But you know what? If we never see that, I, I, I have that same replay in my heart tonight. I remember when I, I was a cripple, and I, I was down on the altar at Brentwood Church. They had that Baptist carpet. It's red with little black dots in it. It was all over the church, and I knelt down over there. Didn't even have an altar for me to rest my head on as I prayed. And the old preacher said, uh, son, what can I do for you? I said, you can't do nothing, preacher. I thank you, but you can't do nothing. I, I just come up here this morning to tell you I'm going to get right over there, and I'm going to talk to the Lord and me, and we're going to be saved today. I want him to come into my my heart and redeem me. I'm a sinner, wretched man. I want to be saved today. And he didn't know what to say. I got over there and started squalling and hollering out loud. And then some of them old people, they had to call rescue and get some of their pills out and put them under the tongue because they had never seen nobody cry in that church. Let me tell you something. They'd never seen the moving of the power of God in that church in that way. And folks, let me tell you, I'm not lying to you. I'm not being boastful or proud. Uh, they told me, uh, God God sure got a hold of you. I said, yes, and I hope he'll get a hold of you. Amen. There was one name there. His name was uh, Mr. Barney something. But he had a big hands. He was bald headed. In fact, his head was bald as Fred's and Mitch's. But he, he was an usher most of the time. And, and he'd stand at the door there, and he'd shake a hand. He'd reach that finger there and put it on your pulse. He's an undertaker. I said, get your hand off me. I'm not ready to go yet. But you know what? They make jokes about the, somebody had a heart attack at the Baptist church. And they had to put two or three out before they found the one that really had it. That's about the truth. And we ought not to laugh about it because it ain't funny. It ain't funny. I can remember when families gathered around at their feet of their mom or their grandmama. You'd go out to somebody's house and a loved one had died and they'd have the old coffin sitting over there in the corner and a lamp burning over your arm. It half dark and no stinky food sitting there on the table but all the neighbors had gathered up there and they were doing everything in their power to comfort that family that had been so rudely disrupted by death. I can remember little children. They weren't running up and down looking for a piece of candy. They were sitting there at their mama's side, and if they wanted to look up, they'd look up and get an indication from the eyes of their parents whether they could move or not. Things have changed, folks. Things have changed. That crowd fell right out there in a minute and shouted right around that coffin. They just love God, and they love one another. And somehow or another, our unbelief and, and that passion at the bottom of the mountain there in that worldly party and atmosphere brother Buck has stripped down and robbed everybody of all that joy we used to have I remember I, I was afraid I was scared that dead person was going to get up because you see they'd use them little things they y'all better be good if I ain't what that 
dead person might get up. You know, they knew better than that. They were not to told us young as that. Parents are not to tell you young as that the booger man's going to get you. There ain't no booger man at my house. He might, if, if you've got some, I'll send what comes by there to your house. We don't have booger men at my house. The only booger man over there is me. <laughs> Amen. But, and that's enough, ain't it, Tom? You didn't have to get all <laughs> over yourself there. I mean, you make these people think something that's not they ought not to be thinking. Oh, uh, you got I'm firing all of you when I get you home. But just think about what happened here. Number one, there's an illustration of how mighty our God is. I mean, just think about that, young. All this grown-up guy there, this guy. And you know that uh, uh, the Shriners Hospital, they got them little kids. And, and, and that works because they're getting people to send $19 a month. But all these kids, they, they're all drawn up, and they've, gone, they've had certain doing much better than they would have been if they hadn't had help. I'm not throwing off on the commercial. But you see what? The efforts of man, though they're helping, though they're good, they're not complete. We, we just put Band-Aids on, on what God would finish. And the finished work of God is a leaping, rejoicing, praising the Lord for what he's doing. Amen. That's what it means when it says, in all things, give thanks. It's hard. Some of you going through stuff right now, it's hard to thank God for. I understand that. But I'm going to tell you, if you'll thank him, it'll be a much easier journey than you could ever imagine. Amen? Listen to me. We've got one more scripture. I know y'all tired. I am too. In fact, I'm going to bring me a pillow and put it right behind there and just... If I get tired, I can lay down. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and this will be our last scripture. Thank you for your patience, and I hope, you, I hope that you're listening and that God has something for you tonight out of this mumbling and stuff that has gone on here, 1 Thessalonians. I'm getting there. I know it's on over here. It's just before 2 Thessalonians. If you love the Lord tonight, tell him you love him. Just tell him I love you, Lord, and I just pray. Do you know he likes to be praised? Uh, our God, he, he, he not only likes it, he's worthy of it. First Thessalonians chapter 4, if you have your Bibles or if you don't look up. Verse 16, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. This is the final event in our life. It's going to be the coming of the Lord to get us. And I'm going to tell you all something. Other than being a pastor teacher, I don't care nothing about what's happening in Revelation. Other than people are getting saved. If it were just the word of God, it's the word of God. It's the only reason. What happens... I, I, I really don't care. I don't care how many moons bleed and how many fish die, how many rivers turn to blood and how many oceans overspill. I don't care because my Lord's coming and I'm going to be out of here. It's going to be over. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, come up here. I heard a voice from heaven. And when I got up there, oh, Lord, he, John begins to relate what he saw. Saw the, the great Savior, the sacrifice, God himself, the worship and praise that's going on there. But I want you to know it's going to be with a loud voice that the Lord comes. He's not going to leave them that are waiting and listening behind. They will hear his voice, and they will be ready for him. When I was in Egypt, I, I, I've told you all before, I remember going and listening. I stayed in a hotel, and they had all these wedding celebrations there. And I thought about some of the stuff that, that Jesus uh, talked about when he talked about the, the marriage supper of the Lamb, when he talked about the bride of Christ. 
and when he talked about the bridegroom. And, and the bridegroom, the, the custom was then and still is today in that part of the world over there in the Mideastern part of the world. And the bride still didn't know when her groom was coming. And, and it could be at midnight, but she had to stay alert because if he came like the virgins, ten, the five virgins who were not ready, and he left them, then their door was closed. There weren't no more weddings. If that bride was not ready for her bridegroom, he went on. He, he, she knew he was coming. It wasn't that she didn't know. She knew he was coming. She just didn't know when. And because of the relationship and the love she ought to have had for him, she ought to have been waiting. And church, I'm going to tell you all tonight, because of the love which you have for Christ, because of the love which he has for you, there ought to be an intimacy and a sincerity in your relationship. And you ought to be listening for him to come. You ought to be waiting for the clouds to burst open. You ought to be listening for the shout because he is coming back. Amen. And he's going to come and he's going to shout loud enough to wake the dead. Hallelujah. I pray in the feeble efforts that I've made, I've said something that might help you. If I have, it's worth it all. It's worth it all. I know that the struggles, I've lived long enough to know how rich and strong struggles can become. I've been mighty weak at times. But, folks, I, I've been thinking since I've been in this church. I was telling Miss Judy on my way from, from my daughter's appointment today, I got a friend request from a young woman that, that I married in 1981. Didn't even have no idea. And she began to ask me how my family was doing and how she appreciated me and my family. And I didn't even know where, the time. I couldn't even put a place how I knew this person. But I, and so I asked, where would I know you from? And when Hope was singing tonight, thank you for giving to the Lord. I thought about it then too. She says, I was at this church you pastored. And that, folks, that's been well, 37 years ago. This person, out of all the pain and hurt, and y'all have heard me mention before, out of all the maltreatment, malfeasance that came to me, here's this, you know, this woman saying, Preacher, I want you to know how much we loved you. How much we talk about you even now after all this time. Just to have it 37 years later, somebody inquiring about your well-being. In fact, I'm going to get back with her tomorrow and just tell her, I, you won't never know how, how much I appreciate just the thought. Just the thought and the remembrance. I just pray that whatever's flipped you around and got you messed up that you can deal with it tonight. Greatest honor in the world that you could ever do tonight is just to throw your hands up and quit fighting and say, Lord, it's going to take you. It's going to take you. If you'll help me, I'll follow you. Girls, where you are? If you'll help me, I'll follow. Some of you are here tonight and lost. It's not because I made a judgment and declared you lost, but because you said you were. In, in despair, life is a carrier of despair. So many people don't know what we're going to do. Did you know we got halfway houses built all around the world? We spend billions of dollars on homeless. Look at the streets of major cities in California. The homeless people. We, money's not going to work. We're going to come to a point in America where that would just be a, a speck on the map of the United States. It's going to be in every major city. It's happening all over the world. What people have tried is not working. And it won't be long for this, what, this Z, is this the Z generation coming that outnumbers the baby boomers? What's it called? Z? What is it? 
cattle prod. But this generation, what I want to tell you is it outnumbers the baby boomers. The baby boomers are our generation. But it's Z something. I don't know what the other rest is. But anyway, they're going to they're being taught in colleges that the earth's going to disappear because of global warming. They're being taught by false teachers. And the scientists are sitting idly by, and they have become a part of this lie. Of course, scientists are like doctors. They don't know what's happening, no way. They just practice on you and hope it works. They find a medicine that they, that's helped two or three, they'll give you some of it until it quits helping you. Oh, well, we'll change your medicine. That's what scientists are. The biggest crowd, they'll go along with the biggest crowd until they're proven wrong. But I'm going to tell you, there ain't nobody can help you spiritually but Jesus. The Holy Ghost, I'll put it that way. The God, the Father, the Son, and Holy Ghost. He can really help you tonight. He can really help you if you will let him. If you'll stand to your feet, what are we singing? I surrender all. If will you surrender your all tonight? Just come right on and offer yourself. There's an altar's road. Take this message to heart. All to Jesus. I surrender. All to him I freely give. Come, now's the time. Don't be jerking around. Hey, pay attention. There's a soul standing between heaven and hell tonight. 